it has a buckle and a groove. Right? So it oscillates like that. So let's see if we can figure out what's constant uh, in the area in this whole curve. I'm just using it. So naively, what, what, what would you expect? There's something oscillating up and down, up and down. So we expect maybe the answer goes like 1 and 2 But in fact, the answer goes like 2 and 9. So somehow this is canceling to shocking accuracy, but always staying positive. And that's why it's so hard to come up with a, so there are, there are many formulas for the coefficients involving plus and, plus and minus signs. There's no formula involving all plus signs. And there has to be a reason for it, because there's humongous cancellation. Any, any such formula has to, has to produce tiny numbers you know, out, of, out of nothing somehow. That's one reason. I can give you a, a similar reason. So let's say we take this uh, polynomial coordinator, and I just make it look like a tiny modification to it. After all, it has two keys, almost, 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 almost go up to one. Let me just add one final root at one. Why not? If I add that final root, the statement is false. Because I go to coset equals one, the left hand side is zero, the right hand side is positive. So it's really sensitive. If I take the roots and I move them around a little bit, it's false immediately. So there's something very magical about this. Uh, about this uh, and anyway, I can tell you a hundred things about it without proving it. I mean, uh, but uh, what I'll just say one one thing: it has uh, the space of polynomials that have this property that they're positive. That is positive game variables. They actually naturally form a ring because if you add two of them, it's obviously positive. And also, if you multiply two of them, it stays positive. Yeah. So that's because if you take the product of two gigabyte polynomials, you get a sum of gigabyte. It's simply that spin one times spin two is a sum of all the other Or, you know, at high school level, cos m theta and cos n theta is cos m minus n theta plus cos m plus n theta. Right? So if you take the product of two, you also get
and now we'll uh, have the last talk from Tom Hartman. Modular bootstrap. Okay, we're going to change gears a little bit today um, and talk about the spectrum of gravity and of conformal field theory, which is something we learn about by studying the finite temperature partition function. And um, I'm going to start just by telling you some things that we know about the spectrum of 3D gravity. And actually, everything that I say today will be um, CFT2 uh, or, or ADS3. So at this point, I'm restricting to two-dimensional conformal field theories. Uh, so what do we know about the spectrum of 3D gravity? Uh, well, there's a vacuum. That's empty ADS. Uh, that's down at uh, energy E is equal to minus C over 12, where um, C is this central charge. That's a Casimir energy. There's uh, BTZ black holes that we talked about last time. Um, the BTZ black holes start at a finite energy, which is E equals 0. So the massless BTZ black hole uh, has a gap above the vacuum of size C over 12. Um, okay, so then up at plus C over 12, uh, another special thing happens, which is that uh, the BTZ black holes above uh, this plus C over 12 are thermodynamically stable. Uh, so if you remember the, the, the BTZ black hole and thermal ADS had this Hawking page transition uh, that exchanged dominance between the two saddles. Well, uh, it's at this point where beta is equal to 2 pi. And uh, if we're on this side of Hawking page, then we're in the black hole phase. If we're on the other side of Hawking page, we're in the thermal ADS phase. Um, so these black holes in here exist, and, and you, can, you can make them. They, they, they dominate the microcanonical ensemble, but don't dominate the canonical ensemble, um, which we saw when we talked about the partition function and, and, and Hawking page. OK, so um, there are also others. We, we, I, there's always other solutions that can appear besides the, the universal uh, black hole and thermal, thermal ADS saddle. And what happens in examples is that those other solutions start here somewhere. So uh, by other, I mean other solutions with a horizon. So these are solutions with a macroscopic entropy. Um, and those start at some point uh, below the BTZ threshold, um, but above the vacuum. Um, well, I guess, so the question is whether the black holes exist um, as energy eigenstates below the transition. Um, I think that to really answer whether they're stable in the microcanonical ensemble, we have to, we have to restrict to a particular theory. But there are, there are examples where they are stable and dominate the microcanonical ensemble. They're, they're only unstable in the canonical ensemble. And so you, but if we just work at fixed energy, then uh, these typically dominate. Yeah, so the question of whether the quantum state is stable or not stable is not a question of ensemble. Um, that's true, but uh, but the there have to be so the, so there, I think that there since these black holes are are here and they have large entropy, I think there have to be a lot of states there. You write that there could be dynamical instabilities, and maybe the states aren't actually these BTZ black holes. But I think we do know from the existence of the black holes that there have to be lots of states. I'm not sure that we know that. I'm not sure we know that for sure. I'm not sure we know that for sure. There could be instabilities in, in particular theories that change the spectrum here. I, I'm not sure exactly what we know about the spectrum here.
OK, so the goals of modular bootstrap, uh, at least the goals relevant to gravity, are uh, to understand the origin of this picture. Another goal is to answer the question, does three-dimensional pure gravity exist? Um, so in order to ask whether it exists, we should say what it is. Uh, the, the, and that, that's open to, open to interpretation, I think. Uh, but the simplest definition of what might be a three-dimensional theory of pure gravity is a theory with no primaries below the black hole threshold, which is energy zero. When I write that tilde there, I mean up to order one. So the central charge here, C, is large. Um, so we're not going to get picky about whether it's, uh, it's C over 12 or C minus 1 over 12, uh, but um, that's, the, that's the, maybe the most, we could say, the most strict definition of pure gravity, um, because there are no states other than the states of the black holes. We don't know the answer to this question. So uh, the, the literature has sort of gone back and forth about this. There's uh, been proposals for 3D pure gravity. There have been arguments that it can't possibly exist. There have been loopholes found in those arguments. There have been loopholes found in the loopholes. Uh, so this, is, this has been a fun story. Uh, but the answer is still unknown. Um, yeah. When I'm, yeah, for all this discussion about the relation to gravity, I'm restricting to C much greater than 1. I don't know whether I, I, I think I would like to consider a, a theory of pure gravity with C equals a million, yeah. even if it's not in a family. I think I'd like to count that. That would be interesting if there are isolated theories like that. But usually we talk about families. If the answer is yes, uh, well, then you might hope to solve it. What I mean by solve it, uh, well, uh, for example, defines its spectrum. What is the spectrum of the uh, theory uh, corresponding to pure gravity? And why, might, why, why can we even hope to do this? Well, I'm going to be talking about bootstrap techniques and uh, imposing bounds on the spectrum using the bootstrap. Uh, if you've seen any, any talks about bootstrap, you know what people have done with the Ising model is uh, to impose constraints from the bootstrap. And um, at first, they were just bounds. You, know, you get some sort of ugly looking curve in parameter space, uh, and it's just a bound. But then uh, you work harder and harder, you get stronger and stronger bounds, and you actually solve the theory. So the, the constraints become so strong, if you are smart enough and work hard enough, you get constraints that are so strong that they essentially uniquely specify the theory for you. And that's been done with the three-dimensional criticalizing model. And uh, the, the <coughs> part of the hope of part of the the, the hope of, of people studying modular bootstrap is to be able to do something uh, similar for pure gravity. The idea is that maybe if you can make the bounds strong enough, you can actually um, start to, to solve this theory. If the answer is no, well, great. That's a great answer, too, uh, because then you've proved that there has to be something uh, besides gravity below the black hole threshold. So what is it? Is it, is it, is it string theory? Is it, is it, um, does it have higher dimensions? What are the requirements of the theory below the black hole threshold? threshold? So if the answer is no, then um, you can ask, what is it that you need in order to get a consistent theory of quantum gravity in three dimensions? OK, so either way, it's kind of win-win if you can get these bounds uh, to be strong enough. This is related uh, as a way of exploring the UVIR connection that we have in quantum gravity. So uh, you know, the, 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 well, the first 
the first part of Nima's lectures and everything we learn about effective field theory uh, for QFT is about the decoupling of UV and IR. But there are a lot of hints, uh, most, most uh, simply the ones coming from black holes, that in quantum gravity the story is different. That in quantum gravity there really are restrictions on uh, what you can have in, at, at low energy. And um, modular bootstrap is a way of trying to pin down what those restrictions are. Uh, so the, the questions that you hear about symmetries and whether you have to have charged states, weak gravity, the swampland, um, these are, some of these you might be able to directly address uh, with modular bootstrap or by combining modular bootstrap with other kind of bootstrap methods. Uh, it's not clear. But at least um, this seems a promising way to try, to try to nail this down just from first principles. The other one, uh, which is not a large C thing and one I won't really talk about, um, is uh, to apply the modular bootstrap to the string world sheet. Because um, if, you can apply, if you can understand what kind of theories exist on the string world sheet, then you can study, for example, what types of geometries exist. One of the things that people have tried and so far not succeeded in doing, uh, for example, is to study the space of, is to constrain the space of Calabi-Yau's, or maybe even to prove that they're a finite uh, set of Calabi-Yau's using the modular bootstrap. OK. Um, OK, so I think you've, you've, already, uh, you've already talked about modular invariance. Uh, she talked about it in his lectures. So let me just write the equation. Z of beta uh, is equal to Z of 4 pi squared over beta. So beta here is my temperature. Um, in terms of the tau that she used, this is I beta over 2 pi. Uh, so this is the sum e to the minus beta e um, equals the sum of e to the minus 4 pi squared over beta e, where e is the energy on the circle, which is a conformal dimension delta minus c over 12. OK, so that's the modular bootstrap equation. That's, the, that's modular invariance. And our goal is to learn what we can about conformal field theories by studying this equation. This is a pretty complicated equation. It looks simple. It's pretty complicated. Uh, it's, a infinite, it's, an infinite number of, it's a functional equation in beta uh, for an infinite number of unknowns, which you can think of uh, as the spectrum and degeneracies or, or just as the spectrum. There are two useful approaches. Uh, I guess first I should say that I'm working at c greater than 1. But at c less than 1, uh, these theories are, are, are rational. Or if we have a larger chiral algebra, uh, there's a different restriction on c. But I'm not talking about rational theories. If you're talking about rational theories, uh, where things decompose into a finite number of representations of the algebra, then there's way more things that you can do. And I'm talking exclusively about the case where you can't play those games, where you don't, have, uh, you don't have the power of rational CFT. So in that case, there are basically two useful approaches to studying this equation. The first is to take limits. Uh, some useful limits here are beta goes to 0. or central charge goes to infinity. And uh, the second approach is uh, what I call the functional bootstrap. This is sometimes called the numerical bootstrap, but it's not necessarily numerical. Uh, but this is what people are doing when they, when they do numerics. 
And as we'll see, this is, roughly speaking, a uh, expansion around the self-dual temperature beta equals 2 pi. Although this expansion, in some cases, can be done to all orders, in which case it's not really an expansion at all. It's really just a, a, a study of the full properties of this crossing equation. Any questions so far? I'm mostly going to be working at zero angular potential. So in Xi's lectures, he probably had uh, tau, and, tau and tau bar. Um, and I've set beta to be a real number, uh, so that uh, just set the angular potential to zero. Uh, that's just sort of to keep the discussion simple. A lot of what I'm saying has generalizations to the, the case with angular potential, or also generalizations to other interesting setups, like with chemical potential and charges and that sort of thing. So I'm just going to discuss number one here pretty briefly, and then I want to mostly talk about the functional bootstrap. Um, Let's look at the limit beta goes to zero. So in the limit beta goes to zero, uh, the right-hand side of this equation up here is trivial. And uh, so we just have e to the minus beta e is equal to, uh, well, beta is zero, so only the lowest energy state here is going to contribute. So this is 4 pi squared over beta times the energy of the vacuum state, uh, which itself is minus c over 12. So that's e to the pi squared 3, so pi squared c over 3 beta. And here we see what is basically the, the, first, sort of the first trick of bootstrap uh, is to be able to solve equations like this. Okay, so uh, how can we, on the left-hand side, we have a sum of exponentials um, in e to, the, e to the plus beta. On the right-hand side, we have something that's very singular as we take beta to zero. Well, individually, uh, clearly, the, any individual terms on the left-hand side are not going to produce anything like this. Uh, so the only way to produce um, this term, on, this singular term on the right-hand side, is through the is through the infinite sum. In other words, the tail of the sum, as you go up to infinite energies here, has to be responsible for this singularity. As we take as we take beta to zero. Uh, the very high energy stuff here is going to matter. Um, and so we can read off from this equation uh, the asymptotics of the left-hand side. This is, a, this is called the Cardi formula. Uh, but the method that I just described is much more general and has played a big role in the conformal bootstrap also for correlation functions. The sort of lesson here is that the asymptotics uh, on the left-hand side of a bootstrap equation are controlled by the singularity on the right. The actual formula is easy to derive in a couple of lines. Uh, maybe I'll skip the algebra, uh, but in order to reproduce the singularity, you can check that uh, the density of states, S, has to be 2 pi root C over 3 E as E goes to infinity. There are two ways to check that formula. One is just to plug it in. Just, just plug in an E to the S here and check that it indeed reproduces the singularity that you wanted on the right-hand side. The other way is to use thermodynamics. Um, just take S equals 1 minus beta d beta log of uh, the right-hand side. Okay, so that's the ordinary thermodynamic entropy, and then you can convert that uh, to the formula for S of E. Now, the, 
This is totally universal. So this works in any two-dimensional conformal field theory. Uh, but it tells you in, in, it works in any theory, uh, but it works only in the limit of energy going to infinity. So in particular, energy is going to infinity with everything else held fixed, like the central charge and um, anything, anything else. So, so E has to be much bigger than C. Um, another thing that you can do is study the limit of the central charge to infinity. Here, I'm not going to go through the details because I want to talk about the functional bootstrap, but I'll just state the answer, state the result, that you can do something very similar to what we did here in the large C limit. And uh, what you find is that S of E is equal to this 2 pi root C over 3E for E greater than or equal to C over 12 if and only if there is a sparse light spectrum, uh, which means that um, for E less than 0, S of E is less than or equal to 2 pi E plus C over 12. So in this case, there's a, um, there's a much stronger statement that you can make. Right? In, the, in, the, in a general conformal field theory, uh, we could take this bootstrap equation and learn about the asymptotics by taking beta to 0. Uh, but when you have large C and a sparse light spectrum, uh, then you learn about the spectrum not only in an asymptotic regime, you sort of learn about it everywhere. Not quite everywhere. Uh, in this case, it turns out to be just above C over 12. And uh, this matches that picture that I drew over there uh, for the spectrum of 3D gravity. This is a very universal feature of two-dimensional CFTs with large central charge, that they give a spectrum like this. So that's sort of the other lesson to extract from this is that, um, and, and this also is something that, that shows up all over the place in the bootstrap, is that um, when in, in general theories, you can use this trick to match singularities to asymptotics. But in large N theories, or large C theories, relevant to holography, uh, the, the regime of validity of these equations gets extended. Okay, so the, the, because basically the OPE is more powerful in large N theories because you have better control from this extra parameter. Uh, and this appears also, say, in the correlator bootstrap, where uh, the analog of the Cardi formula is working with correlation functions in the light cone limit. Okay, so you can work in the light cone limit and uh, learn about the singularities, or sorry, learn about the high spin spectrum of a correlation function by looking at singularities. But in large n theories, you can do something stronger. And there's something analogous um, to this result, where you can really derive holographic results just by using large n. OK, I did this quick because I want to talk about the functional bootstrap. But let me pause and see if there's questions about these limits uh, before we go on. Yeah? Is there any difference if you, like, for, for the Cardi bound, is there any difference if you include, like, all the Virasoro tower? The question is if it makes a difference to account for Virasoro. And in this bound, the answer is no for the leading term. Uh, if you account for Virasoro, you can get more refined statements about the spectrum. Um, but for the for sort of the order C piece of it, you don't learn anything new. Other questions? Okay, so the functional, or in quotes, numerical approach. Um, so this started with. Simeon Hellerman has been developed by various people since then, uh, and also uses some methods that came from 
uh, the correlator bootstrap. So the first step is just to move everything onto the left-hand side of the bootstrap equation. So we have some e to the minus beta e minus e to the minus 4 pi squared over beta e equals to 0. Um, now, at this point, actually, I do want to use the symmetry. Uh, so um, I want to organize things under the Chiral algebra, as you saw in Xi's lectures. Uh, so this is just going to be, instead of having uh, just these exponentials, we're going to have characters of the Chiral algebra. So this is sum of chi delta of beta minus chi delta of 4 pi squared over beta equal to 0. For Virasoro, these characters um, are just q to the delta minus c minus 1 over 12 over eta squared, where q is e to the 2 pi i tau, which is e to the minus beta. So I'm translating notation to what um, to the standard thing that she used. This is the character, this is actually, I think she would have called this the character squared. This is, I'm working at, I'm working at zero angle potential. I'm not separating out left and right. So this is the, the product of the left chiral character and the right chiral character. That's why eta is squared here. Another one uh, that we're going to use is the U1 uh, to the C current algebra. Uh, so this is just the, the symmetries associated to C-free bosons. Now, the theory does not have to be a theory of C-free bosons, uh, but it has the symmetries of that. Um, so this has chi delta is q to the delta over eta to the 2c. Um, OK, so we have our bootstrap equation here. And uh, the next thing we're going to do is to go get some color. So the next thing we're going to do here is to act on this equation with a linear functional. F here is a functional <coughs> that acts on functions of beta. So for example, we could integrate uh, over beta against the kernel. Or we could just evaluate at beta equals 6. That's a functional. Or we could uh, do well, something more elaborate that we're going to do here. Um, Tom, what is the exponent on eta on, in the u1 cross u1? Um, it's eta to the 2c. Did I write that? Yeah, I just can't say. Yes, eta to the 2c. Yeah, I'm trying to remember to s stay away from this part of the board because it gets hard. But OK, so um, if we act on, so we've, when, we, when we act on that equation with a functional, uh, it just turns into an equation like this, sum f of delta I, 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 I keep switching back and forth between e and delta. Sorry if I do that. It's, it's, they just differ by a c over 12. And I, I might be switching them in my head as I go. Um, but let me use delta now. So um, now we just get a, a, a sum that's sum of f of delta is equal to 0. Beta is gone because we've acted on this with a linear functional uh, act that, that kills the betas. This is, the, uh, this is sort of the, the workhorse of the, of the functional bootstrap, is this crossing equation now written, in, uh, now written after acting with a functional. It contains the same information as the, as the previous equation, 
There, uh, all the different crossing equations, all the different information about crossing was sort of encoded in all the different values of beta. Here, all the information about crossing is encoded in the fact that we could have acted with many different functionals. Okay, so we sort of traded beta for our choice of functional. Now what are we going to do? Well, there's various things we can try to do with the bootstrap, but I'll focus on the simplest one. Uh, which is not only the simplest, it's also the one that's sort of relevant to this problem of, of um, asking whether pure gravity exists or trying to constrain the theory of pure gravity as much as possible. And this question is, given the central charge C, given C, what is the max delta 1? In other words, uh, I know where the, the, the vacuum is at zero or minus C over 12 in energy language, uh, then how, how high can I push up the dimension of the first primary state? Can I push it all the way up to the black hole threshold, delta equals C over 12? Um, so in, in 3D gravity, delta 1 is around C over 12. Uh, but, uh, well, is that the answer, or is it, is, can we push it up even higher than the black hole threshold? Are we forced to include states below the black hole threshold? Uh, that is the question. Sorry, I, I missed something probably when I was worrying about what that was going on. What exactly is little f? Yeah, let me write an equation for little f. Um, here. f of delta is the functional acting on chi delta of beta minus chi delta of 4 pi squared over beta. I haven't said at this point what the functional is. That's something we're going to choose later. OK, and, and what functional we choose depends on what question we're trying to, to answer. So now we're going to focus on this question. We're trying to maximize the dimension of the We're trying to place a bound on the, on the first state. To do that, we seek an f that looks like the following. OK, so I'm going to plot as a function of delta uh, what I would like my f of delta to look like. What we're going to look for are, are functions that look like this. OK, so there, there's something going on at negative that doesn't really matter. They won't even draw it. Um, they do some, some wiggling, and then they go positive. OK. So if we can find a functional that looks like this, then we've derived a bound on all possible CFTs. <coughs> Call this delta star. If you find a functional that looks like this, this is positive over here, it's positive, it's greater than or equal to 0 on the vacuum, um, and positive over here. If you find a function like this, this implies that all CFTs have delta 1 less than or equal to delta star. Here it matters that all those coefficients of the chi's were positive, right? Yes. Is the fact that the coefficients are like integer? No, that's not the, uh, the question is whether the integerness of the coefficients is playing any role. And the answer is no. We don't know how to put that in in any useful way. In practice, are the integers kind of big, so they're pretty close? They're, they're probably, it doesn't matter that much. They're huge. Sometimes they're exactly integers, and I'm going to come to that, and that's going to be super interesting. OK. Um, they're not always exactly 
No, if you just if you just do this problem at c equals I don't know six point eight, then you're not going to find a gap. You're not going to find a bound that's an integer. Now, now, a real theory it should be an integer, but. I just meant the, the, the coefficients in, in terms of the, the coefficients of the chi deltas are integers. Yeah, well, yeah, I'm summing over the spectrum here, so that's going to give a multiplicity as an right, integer, right. yeah. So, so that's right. You're, you're using that those numbers are positive, but not that they're. Correct. Integer. I'm using the fact that they're positive, but not that they're integer, yeah. OK, so uh, why is that? Well, we're, we're summing up f over this. Over this for any CF, we can act on, act on any CFT with this functional, and we're summing up f on the spectrum. And uh, well, if suppose a theory has a has a gap here, no, there's no states here. Well, then every contribution to that sum is going to be positive. There's a there's a contribution from the vacuum, and once you have that contribution from the vacuum, you know you must have a negative contribution somewhere in the spectrum, and that means there has to be a state in this place where your functional went negative. Now at this point, it's not guaranteed that you can find a functional like this. I just said I, I, would, I would sure love to have a functional that, that has this shape, uh, but you don't get to make up any old function. You have to actually construct it uh, with this formula. You have to actually find a functional that acts on the characters and gives you the shape of function that you would like. Okay, so that's what you do in the functional bootstrap. So what do you actually do? You, you optimize the functional to maximize delta star while requiring everything over there to be positive. When you actually do this in practice, when you, when you try to do an optimization, you're always going to find something that just barely satisfies the constraints. Okay, that's what happens when you optimize. So you find things that, that saturates the constraints as much as possible. Okay, and the constraint that we're imposing here is positivity on the right-hand side. So uh, when we actually optimize it, we optimize the functional, uh, it's going to look something like this. OK, so what's happening here, this is delta star. And um, we're, we're, running, we're optimizing this functional. I, I'm not telling you how we're doing the optimization. It doesn't really matter. You could, you could do this by hand. You could just write down, start writing down functionals and do this by hand. Um, and this is what you're going to find uh, when you optimize, because uh, you're, you're, you're maintaining that everything over here has to be positive, uh, but it's just going to barely be positive. So you're going to find all these double zeros. And um, not only, so, so when you do this, you not only get a bound on the gap, delta 1, uh, you also get a candidate theory or partition function by looking at where these constraints saturate. So uh, these zeros here give you uh, the optimal spectrum that actually saturates uh, the, the bound on the gap that you've derived. So this is, uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, running these conformal bootstrap methods um, can not only give you bounds, but actually give you theories. Because uh, when, you, when you push the bounds all the way to the optimum, you learn the spectrum of the resulting theory, which is a solution of the crossing equation. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the, the comment is you only get the partition function, not the full theory. That's right. So what you get is a, is a spectrum that satisfies the bootstrap equation that you've started with. Uh, now, we know that there are lots of other conditions. Well, there are several conditions that CFTs must satisfy, and this is just one of them. So there is no guarantee that, that this is a complete theory. You have to go impose all the, all the other constraints. Uh, but if you get lucky, you might get a complete theory. Sometimes that happens. 
or you can use this as a starting point to start imposing those other constraints. Um, <coughs> Um, mm, well, if you want to if you want to find ba upper and lower, the comment is about extracting the degeneracies is harder. Um, if you want to find upper and lower bounds on the degeneracies, yes. But if you just want to find the degeneracies that solve that equa that solve the crossing equation, then they come for free, <laughs> almost. I mean, okay, it's like one extra equation you have to solve, but it's just a linear equation that's very easy to solve. You don't have to do any work to find the degeneracies of this optimal, of this optimal partition function. But the solution may not be yeah. That is correct. OK, so um, now in practice, uh, this, we're trying to optimize a functional. And there's an, infinite, uh, there's an infinite set of functionals. So we have to pick some uh, basis of functionals to work with. And in practice, um, one thing you can do is to pick some finite, is to truncate to some finite basis and then optimize on a computer. For the modular bootstrap, a convenient way to do this is to act, is to take a functional, which is a sum of i equals 1 to p, alpha i, uh, 1 over 2 times 2i minus 1 factorial, 1 plus beta squared d beta to the 2i minus 1, 1 plus beta over 2 root beta, um, evaluated at beta equals 2 pi. This looks a little complicated. We could have just, we could have just acted with derivatives, but the reason that I'm making this slightly more complicated functional uh, is because it gives f of delta, um, which is a Laguerre polynomial which I like because it has a name. Sum over i, l, 2i minus 1, of um, 4 pi delta minus c minus 1 over 12, e to the minus 2 pi delta, where l is the Laguerre. This step is really annoyingly hard for correlation functions. Okay, so like if you want to bootstrap the 3D Ising model, then um, instead of having these nice, char these nice exponential characters that we have uh, for, for modular bootstrap, you have to have conformal blocks. For 3D Ising model, the conformal blocks don't even have a closed formula. Um, and then when you act with functionals, you get some crazy functions that you, that you really have to think about, that you really have to use a computer for. Um, but for the modular bootstrap, uh, you, get, you get something pretty nice, which is these, these Laguerre polynomials. OK, and then you can optimize over alphas uh, to derive your functional. And you try to get a wiggly looking functional that looks as much like this as possible. And that's how you derive your bounds. The results of this uh, depend, of course, on your, uh, your trunk, how, how high you truncate. So if you're doing this on a computer or by hand, by, by, and, and actually, everyone should do this by hand. I mean, this is kind of fun. OK, you can just literally type in the first few Laguerre polynomials in the Mathematica and start like, adding them up in linear combinations and just try to make it look like this. And you can derive bounds that are like, almost as good as the totally uh, optimal uh, uh, high power computer bounds that I'm about to quote. You can, you can do this just by kind of staring at Laguerre polynomials for five minutes. If you truncate uh, at just two polynomials, this is what Simeon Hellerman did in the original paper, you find a bound that delta 1 is less than around c over 6. Note that there's an uh, infamous or famous uh, or notorious factor of 2 here compared uh, to the black hole threshold in 3D gravity. In 3D gravity, there's a gap of c over 12 between the vacuum and the first black hole. 
So by bootstrap, we are not, we are not achieving what we might have expected from looking at the spectrum of 3D gravity. That would have been C over 12. And um, that's trying to, trying, to, trying to close that gap has been one of the big motivations of doing modular bootstrap. If you can try to push this down to C over 12, that's where you might hope to answer these questions that I, that I, to start answering these questions that I wrote on the board at the beginning. If you take the truncation order um, much bigger, say in the thousands, um, then you can estimate the asymptotic bound and you get delta 1 is less than about C over 9.08. That seems to be the asymptotic. You can't prove that, of course, because, um, well, because the, the bigger the central charge is, the, the no bigger number of polynomials you have to include to get a good bound. Okay, so if you really want to learn about the gravitational limit where C, is, where C goes to infinity, if you really want to learn about C goes to infinity, well, you have to do something analytically. You, you can never truly learn about that limit by truncating. Uh, but you can estimate it by, by, by staring at these functions, and that seems to be the asymptotics. There's another approach, uh, which is to do the functional bootstrap analytically. Okay, so uh, by finding functionals that go that include an infinite number uh, that that truncate that don't truncate at some finite order here, um, and if you can find functionals analytically, say just by guessing or whatever, however you find them. Uh, once you have them, they prove for you strict bounds. So if you can find one, if you can find a functional um, that does better, then, um, and you can do this, if you can do it by hand, say, uh, then you can get a better bound. And at this point, analytic functionals have, proved, have been used to prove the bound delta 1 is less than over about c over 8.503. And what I'm going to discuss in my last 27 minutes is um, how to use analytic functionals uh, to constrain the partition function. Uh, mostly because this connects to a fun math problem. So now I have to tell you about this fun math problem. And then we'll come back to the modular bootstrap in a little bit. Questions at this point before I go on to the analytics? Yeah. Why does the entirety actually result in this? Yeah, it was used, um, so it was important that when we had this sum f of delta equals zero, unitarity is like this, unitarity here is the statement that this is a sum of, of positive numbers. Um, if you had a non unitary theory, you might have, you might have negative norm states that show up here and give you minuses in this, in this partition function. Um, and then you wouldn't be able to prove these bounds. Other questions? Yeah. Sorry? The question is, are we assuming that 3D gravity is a unitary 2D CFT dual? And the answer is yes. Well, we're not assuming pure gravity has a unitary dual. I mean, that's sort of the, we're trying to test whether it does, whether it could. Okay, if we can rule out pure gravity, then then it doesn't. Okay, but our starting point is a two-dimensional CFT that's unitary. Okay, so the um, ah, before I tell you the math problem, I want to tell you um, something funny that happens when you run the numerics for certain special values of the central charge. This happens at c equals 12. It also happens at c equals 4. Uh, but I'll write the answer for c equals 12. Uh, so what happens 
and is you do this numerically, and um, your gap, your bound on delta 1 that you find, converges to the integer 2. OK, and the longer you run it, the more zeros you get. OK, so it really seems to be converging to 2. And you can prove that this bound is exactly 2 to like 40 decimal places, numerically. That's bizarre. The, at no point did integers, what? Uh, this was a large C. Sorry, these, this, was at, this was the asymptotics. Oh. Maybe I, sorry, I should have been more clear. This was the asymptotics at large C. Okay, at no point did we, like, assume that the, the spectrum was integer, integer, integer energies. If we had imposed some extra analyticity um, that would be appropriate in a, whole morph in a chiral CFT, uh, then, then these deltas would have to be integers, and this would just be trivial in a chiral CFT. But in a non-chiral CFT, there's no reason, or there's no a priori reason to expect integers to come out of this problem. Okay, but it's actually even crazier than that. Remember I said that you can also extract the optimal partition function, and if you do this numerically, you find the optimal partition function is uh, this vacuum at, at minus c over 12, plus 196884.000000, et cetera, um, Q, plus 214937600.00, et cetera, Q squared, plus dot, dot, dot. And this is a famous function, uh, which is called the J function and is also uh, related to a lattice theta function. So I can write this as 1 over eta to the 24 times the theta function of lambda 24 of Q. This is just a numerical observation. Let me define for you what the quantities are appearing here. Lambda 24 is the leech lattice in R24. And the theta function of a lattice is the sum over points on the lattice of Q to the x squared over 2. And um, this is a bizarre, this, so this numerical observation is a bizarre fact calling for an explanation, right? OK, so there was no reason for lattices to appear here. Lattices are very natural in a free theory, very natural possibly in a chiral theory. There is no reason a priori to expect a lattice to suddenly pop out of nowhere when you uh, study the general space of non-holomorphic uh, 2D conformal field theories. So this is begging for an explanation. And now we come to our fun math problem. The constant, the, the, the constant term no, no, is. No, I'm talking about the, the one over eta to 24 and then say that. I mean, the, the, the theory is supposed to be z2 orbital, not the. Yes, it's off by 24. This is, not the, this is not the partition function of the chiral monster theory. It's slightly different from that. But it is. But this formula is correct, as written, I think. Well, no, that, that is the partition function of the monster up there, but that is the partition function of the Leech theory, and they differ by z two or four, and that kills the twenty. The constant term is z twenty four. This is a pedantic point, but okay. yeah, I, yeah, the, the, yeah. That just that just has to do with the constant. Um, I'm not sure if I can't remember if, if this one has a constant in it. But the constant in, in this problem that we're, we're solving, the constant is itself modular invariant. So, there's, so you don't, it's, it's just trivial. It's just trivial you can set it to zero. <laughs> OK. I think it's not. I think it's, I th I think it's 744 or something. But no, 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 that's you, the you, you, this way of writing it would be minus 24. Oh. 
Oh, that's right. Okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the fun math problem is the problem of sphere packing. So what is the sphere packing problem? Uh, the question of sphere packing is what is the densest configuration of spheres in Rn. Okay, by spheres I mean identical non-overlapping spheres. So this is like how many tennis balls can you throw in a box? This is a fascinating problem uh, in math, not so much because of the question, which sounds a little, which sounds a little silly, uh, but because of the answer um, and, and, and how it relates to various other parts of math. So this is connected to the classification of lattices. It's connected to uh, the construction of error correcting codes. It's connected to uh, finite groups. Uh, just all sorts of interesting math uh, shows up in trying to solve this problem. The answer is known only in some special low, d low dimensions. Okay, so in, in two dimensions, the answer is the honeycomb lattice. In this was the honeycomb lattice, that was proved a while ago, maybe uh, 80 years ago, I think, uh, if I have it right. That, the, it was proved that honeycomb is optimal in two dimensions. Um, in three dimensions, the answer is <laughs> the face center cubic lattice. This is called the Kepler conjecture because it was conjectured by Kepler. Yes, that Kepler. Um, and uh, this is, so this is something that was, was an open problem for hundreds of years. And um, it was, this was finally proved in, I think it was 1998, by Hales. The proof is, uh, is, a, is an epic tour de force. I mean, this proof is, is hundreds of pages of analytics combined with uh, enormous computer programs that check special cases. There's an interesting history here that, that you know, he, so he sent this to a journal to be published and they, they couldn't check it. Like they sent it, to a, they sent it to a team of referees who started checking things by hand. This was kind of er, in, the very, in the early days of computer assisted proofs and nobody really knew like, what do you do with a proof that requires a computer? So they just started checking all the special cases by hand and after like two years of this, they gave up and they said, no, like, we, we, we're pretty sure it's true, but, we, but like, we're not going to work on this anymore. Um, <laughs> and uh, eventually this was like formalized and, and proved on a computer in a formal logic system. Uh, but it's been, this whole big, it's been this whole big thing. So it came, uh, so it was, a, I, it was a real surprise when a couple years ago, um, Vyazovska, solved the cases of 8 and 24 dimensions in uh, a beautiful short paper with a completely analytic argument. So um, the paper of Biazot, the well, there was, there's two papers. Um, there was a paper in eight dimensions by Biazovska where the answer is the E8, E8 lattice. Actually, it was already known that this was answer in a, in a sort of, it was, known, it was basically known numerically, uh, but there was no proof. Okay, so it was Vyazovska that, uh, that gave the proof. And uh, using her method, it took only one week uh, to then prove the case of 24 dimensions uh, where the answer is the leech lattice. Uh, yes, that was also basically known. Yeah. Sorry. The question is whether it gave any insight into the solution of the Kepler conjecture, and the answer so far is no. That Vyazovska's method can be applied in three dimensions, but um, can be shown not to work. So, <laughs> uh, so. Um, you know, maybe it can be tweaked. Maybe there's some, maybe there's some related way. But at this point, it's still Hale's, Hale's 
long proof is still the is still the proof of the Kepler conjecture. Okay, so I'm going to give just enough formulas to explain. Uh, well, the upshot of the punchline, of course, is going to be that this is related to the modular bootstrap, and that um, the leech lattice that's showing up in the modular bootstrap is the same as the leech lattice that's showing up in the sphere packing problem. That's going to be the punchline. And I just want to give enough equations to convince you that these problems are closely related. So we're not going to be able to have time to do the whole thing in 12 minutes. But um, I can show you that these, are, that these are very closely related problems. So um, I want to define, let me start by defining a periodic sphere packing. Why, why periodic? I should comment on this. When we say we want the densest possible sphere packing, we mean of any, of any sphere packing. It doesn't have to be a lattice. So the fact, that the, the fact that in these known cases, the answer is a lattice, this is sort of an accident of low dimensions. There just happen to be very good lattice packings. It's believed, although not proven, that in higher dimensions, um, or even in some dimensions between 8 and 24, the best packings are not lattice packings. But it is sufficient to consider, without loss of generality, periodic packings. So a periodic packing is a crystal. So we have a lattice, lambda, in Rn. And we have a unit cell, uh, V, which is just some set of vectors, V1, V2, up to Vk. And we put the spheres at x plus uh, v for x in the lattice and v in the unit cell. This is just the fancy way of saying that it's a crystal. So you have a, a lattice. You have a lattice structure that's perfectly repeating, but then within each unit cell of the, of the lattice, you have an arbitrary configuration of spheres in that unit cell, say like that, and then we just repeat that um, everywhere on the lattice. This is good enough because for, for bounding the density of, of totally general sphere packings. The reason for that is that um, you can approximate a you can approximate any packing by a lattice pack by a periodic packing just by taking a huge unit cell. The errors in that approximation are edge effects and um, don't affect the density that you're going to bound of ultimately. I'm going to normalize. the volume of the unit cell to be 1. Uh, then the density of the packing is set by uh, the shortest distance between two points. Um, so the minimal xi plus vj minus xk plus vl uh, over, the, over the choice of, of lattice and unit cell, um, because we can just t take this to be twice the radius of the sphere. Right, so if, if, the, if the closest two points anywhere in this packing uh, once we find the closest two points, maybe they're here and here, then uh, obviously we can choose our spheres to be just touching uh, around those two points. And um, since we've, we've, already fixed, we've already normalized the lattice to have volume one, uh, the only question really is how big can we make our spheres? If, uh, the bigger you can make the spheres, the more dense you can make the packing. So another way of saying it is that what we're trying to do is we're trying to maximize this uh, shortest this shortest vector in the packing.
So now, now I want to describe qualitatively at least the, the Cohn-Elkies theorem. So this, this is a theorem from about uh, 2001 or so. Sorry, that doesn't say Elkies. Cohn-Elkies theorem. Uh, so this is this is a uh, a method that was used. This is the method that was used by Vyazovska uh, to to solve the problem in eight and twenty-four dimensions. And the Cohn-Elkies method is uh, essentially the modular bootstrap. Uh, it, was, it was described earlier, so maybe I should say the modular bootstrap is essentially the Cohen-Elkies method. There are some differences in this problem, um, but we'll be able to see why they're so similar. So let me define Z of tau. So I, I have a, some packing defined by a, a lattice and a unit cell. Now I define Z of tau, which is like a partition function, to be 1 over eta of tau to the n, the sum over x in my lattice, the sum over vi and vj in my unit cell of e to the i pi tau x plus vi minus vj squared. So what am I doing? I'm just summing e to the i pi tau times all the distances. This, this is, we're just summing over all pairs of spheres and calculating the distances between them. It's sort of like a theta function. Uh, it's sometimes called an average theta function. It just has this additional structure of summing over the unit cell. Now we're going to use, uh, by the way, I'm, I'm not actually just, I'm, I'm describing this, this Cohen-Elkies theorem in bootstrap language. This is not actually how they did it. The final theorem is going to be the same. But they actually didn't really, they weren't really thinking about it the same way as, as the bootstrap people. But I'm, I'm kind of translating it into our language. So um, the magic formula is going to be the, the Poisson summation formula, which tells you that the sum over a lattice of a function is equal to the sum over the dual lattice of the Fourier transform of the function. OK, so tilde here is the Fourier transform. And uh, what we're going to do is we're going to apply the Poisson summation formula to the lattice, to, to the sphere packing partition function. Any questions at this point? The, the, the V's are, are here. The V's are the vectors of the spheres in the unit cell. Correct. Right. So lambda and V are specifying our packing. So the V also implicitly depends. OK, so V is specifying the packing. Lambda, the, the lattice and, and V, like packing equals lattice and V. <laughs> yeah. So if you apply this formula uh, over there, then what's going to happen? Well, the Fourier transform of a, this is a Gaussian. The Fourier transform of a, of a Gaussian is just another Gaussian. Uh, and when you have this coefficient, it, it, flips the, it flips the coefficient. So it takes tau to minus 1 over tau. That's only true up to a, up to a prefactor, which in n dimensions um, is a, a power. Uh, so I can't quite remember the power. Something like tau to the n over 2 or something. But the eta function here also has some transformation um, under, un, under tau to minus 1 over tau. And that exactly cancels the, uh, that prefactor. So the Poisson summation formula here just gives you z of tau is equal to 1 over eta of minus 1 over tau to the n times the sum over x and the dual lattice of e to the minus i pi x squared over tau times the contribution from those shi from, from shifting the Gaussian. So the contribution from those shifts is the sum over vi in v e to the i x dot v mod squared.
Does that make sense where that came from? So I just, I've just Fourier transformed um, and applied the, I've just applied the, the Poisson summation formula and Fourier transformed the Gaussian. This is the cross, this is the analog of the crossing equation for the sphere packing problem. It's not quite the same. So uh, the, the reason it's not quite the same as, as ordinary modular bootstrap Well, there's two reasons it's not quite the same. One is that um, these things that are showing up here, these, these, these are, so these are like q to the something over eta to the n. These are not Virasoro characters. But they are the characters of the u1 to the n, uh, or u1 to the n over 2, rather, current algebra. That's one difference. The other difference is that um, there's this extra junk appearing on the right-hand side. So the, for, the, in terms of bootstrap language, what we have here is a formula that looks like sum over delta chi delta of u1 to the n over 2 of tau equals sum over delta tilde chi delta tilde u1 to the n over 2 of minus 1 over tau times positive, positive being that mod squared there. Remember these chi's were q to the delta over eta to the 2c, or sorry, in this case, eta to the, eta to the n. Sorry? I think the question was what delta is. So delta is the thing in the exponent in order to make this equation true. So delta is, is um, basically it's x squared. It's, well, it's on, on the left, it's this. On the right, I gave it a different, I called it delta tilde because it's summed over the dual lattice. Uh, but the point is that it has basically the same structure as, as a modular bootstrap problem, uh, up to the fact that we've stuck in these extra coefficients on the right-hand side. And um, so what Cohn and Elkies did, in bootstrap language anyway, is uh, then you, from here, you just proceed exactly as we did half an hour ago for the bootstrap. You have this equation, you act on it with linear functionals, and then you design those functionals to, um, to find constraints on the distance between the lattice vectors. Because delta here, this delta is like x plus vi minus vj squared. And remember, what we're trying to do to find a very dense sphere packing is to make these lattice vectors as far apart as possible. So we apply a linear functional. And then we optimize functionals to prove bounds on the packing density. When Cohn and Elkies did this um, in 2001 or so, they, they proved this, so they, so they proved a theorem which says that if you, if you can find a, a function, so, so what they did is they go looking for these wiggly functionals, these wiggly functions just like we do. No, they, so they start looking for these wiggly functions um, and then use the zeros of these functions to find constraints on the sphere packing density. So they proved a theorem that if you can find these functions, then you have a bound. And then they studied this numerically. And they did this in a way similar to what we do in numerical bootstrap. Um, and that, was, that basically proved that E8 and lambda 24 are optimal in 8 and 24 dimensions. But it only proved it like to 10 decimals or to, so it, it only proved it in the numerical sense. And um, so it was a, that's why it was still an open problem um, until Vyazovska's paper came along. So what Vyazovska did uh, is to find the functional analytically. So what Vyazovska did was to find an analytic formula for a functional that looks like this. 
um, analytically, where the zeros of this <coughs> function uh, are at the x squared of the E8 or lambda 24 lattice, which are integers. Okay. So she found a functional analytically which has zeros at the integers and um, can be plugged into the cohn elkies theorem, uh, and that proves that, 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 these are, that these are optimal. So now um, the last thing I want to say, questions? Good. That's, that's only two minutes over. Okay. Um, so the last thing I want to say is just exactly what the relationship is uh, to the modular bootstrap. I think it's. I think I've written enough formulas that you can you can see that these are kind of the same problem. Um, but uh, what is the precise relationship? The precise relationship, uh, which I'll just state, and you can ask me about it afterward, is two things. Um, First of all, uh, Vyazovska's f for E8 and lambda 24 is exactly equal to uh, the Virasoro bootstrap functional for c equals 4 and c equals 12. So this is the functional that I wrote up earlier uh, that we knew numerically had to magically be the, uh, had, to, had to magically have exactly the zeros at the, leech, at the, at the vectors of the leech lattice. Uh, well, now we have a function with zeros at the vectors of the leech lattice, and it's exactly the same function. The other statement is that, in general, um, the sphere packing problem maps to the u1 to the c bootstrap with c equal to 2n. Uh, wait, n over 2. So the, the formula is that the sphere packing density in Rn is bounded by pi over 2 to the n over 2 over gamma of n over 2 plus 1 times delta of u1 to the n over 2 to the n over 2, where this delta appearing on the right-hand side is, uh, the, is exactly the bound you would get from the bootstrap problem. So this is the bound that would come out of uh, numerically optimizing your functionals, uh, for example. Um, and I lied one last thing, um, which is the I mentioned the, earlier this um, bound at large c. So you can generalize Vyazovska's method to, to n dimensions. Um, and it's essentially that method that gives uh, this delta 1 less than c over 8.503 as c goes to infinity. In fact, this generalization had already been done uh, by um, Mazak in studying uh, correlation functions. And it was just a matter of uh, sort of changing variables and mapping, uh, mapping between modular bootstrap and, and the sphere packing problem and the and the correlation functions. But um, I will stop there. OK, thanks a lot. Questions. 
So C is, is n over 2, where n is the number of space dimensions. So this is like packing spheres in a very large number of dimensions. This is actually something that mathematicians have talked about because of the connection to error correcting codes. So uh, why I, I can, in 30 seconds, tell you the connection, which is just that um, you can think of a code as a bunch of vectors. And then if I send you a message, um, you just pick the nearest vector. So like if I send you a message through a noisy channel, and uh, you label that as some point in Rn, and, but we've agreed beforehand on a set of allowed code words, then you can decode my message through a noisy channel by just picking the closest vector. Okay, so by putting as many vectors as po by packing in as many vectors as possible, but not putting any two of them very close together, you get a very efficient code. So that's why sphere packing is related to codes. And, and, and people have studied the, the limit of a large number of dimensions because um, you might like to study codes that basically allow a, a lot of letters. In, in the code, so that you can encode lots of things. Yeah? So when you have the difference of two characters in the sphere packing problem, one of them is multiplied by a positive number, as you say. So it's clear that a bootstrap type approach should work for that. But why should the same functional bound also saturate the bootstrap problem where it's purely the difference? Yeah, so the, the question is, um, why does it give the same answer? Because, because they're not quite the same problem. Uh, and the sphere packing problem with these extra coefficients on the right-hand side. And uh, the answer to that actually is not known. So it just turns out that um, in the sphere packing problem, um, you can decompose the sphere packing problem into sort of an even, p an even part and an odd part. One of those is the, the, the odd part is literally the modular bootstrap. The even part is, 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 the, is coming from that extra coefficient. But it just turns out that once you solve the odd part, you can, in practice, always uh, get the same bound for the even part. So you end up with all the same answers. 